model box art. We're going to revisit this topic. Do you have any favorites? I sure do. And I'm going to share them with you now in this episode of Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machat. Okay, tell me if this has ever happened to you. It's Saturday morning. You've been waiting all week. You've saved up your allowance, your lawnmower uh, money, your newspaper route money. You have a buck 50 in your pocket, and you're going to go down to that hobby shop with all your friends and park your bikes outside and go in and buy a model. Uh, sound familiar? Well, I know uh, these guys definitely do. Uh, Max's Models, best model channel on YouTube. Uh, greetings to all the great uh, glue troopers out there. Hope you enjoy this episode. But uh, I, have a, I have a hunch that uh, all you guys have done this, uh, this uh, very activity. So you walk into the store, and there they are, just shelves and shelves of models. And you're going to make a decision on which one you want to buy by looking at the box art. Uh, you want a jet bomber, you want a rocket plane, a Navy uh, plane, you want an uh, airliner. What would you like today? Oh, you went with the Lindbergh Republic CB. Good choice. Nice kit. Beautiful job. Look at that. Man, that, that's a nice weekend project. Super. Well, you made that decision based on the box art. And that's really an important factor. If you look at these two images, uh, two different companies, two totally different design uh, philosophies in terms of depicting an airliner, it's the Douglas DC-8. And uh, in making that choice, does it really come down to the best artwork? Or is it the most accurate or the most dramatic? How about the most powerful image you've seen or the most evocative? Maybe it's the best representation of the airplane. Or maybe it just looks cool. So I'm going to share with you my top 10 favorite Ravel covers. And this is a, a subjective list. I can't really explain why. I just know that these were the ones that, that always stood out. I want to mention, uh, full disclosure, I'm going to talk about these covers. And in no way uh, do I mean anything disrespectful in terms of critique. Uh, nothing derogatory. I'm just talking about how these artists uh, created these images. And let's get into it. Number 10, Jack Lenwood, the 132nd scale Ravel World War II series, his absolute favorite uh, favorites of all the ones that he did for Ravel, because as he said, they were large enough to get juicy with them, get in there and get a lot of detail. He really had a good time with this. This is uh, Ira Kepford's uh, VF-17 Corsair, F4U. And... Um, where do I even begin? I mean, it's just a, a action packed uh, cover airplanes coming out at you. The classic uh, Lenwood crowding the box, as he used to say, cropping the wingtips. And those airplanes are just blasting into the into the uh, ether as it uh, comes out at you. And you're going to build that model. So that was one of a series of 132nd scale World War II uh, kits that were quite stunning in, the, in their day. And number nine is the Prius Martin B57B based on the Canberra. Now, this is the poster child for the three basic rules of uh, effective illustration uh, in commercial use. It's the uh, usage of cool and warm colors, light and dark design elements, and bright and dull surfaces. Well, there they are. And notice that the sky is the same exact color as the desert, and it works. Always love this kit. Number eight. Ah, Jack Linwood's Martin Seamaster in the famous artist, famous airplane series commemorating the 50th anniversary of naval aviation. Now, let's take a look at this. The green lines that you see here are the perspective axes uh, that go theoretically go back to a vanishing point on the horizon. The red line at upper right is what Jack did to the horizontal stabilizer of the airplane. He bent it or rotated it, as you see there, uh, on purpose for uh, two very good reasons. Number one, uh, you, that way you can see the three parachutes on the mines that the airplane is uh, jettisoning from its rotary bomb bay. And number two, uh, it, it's, it's distorted and it attracts your eye and makes you look at the kit. And in Jack's own words, that made you buy it. Number seven, oh, the KC-135 Stratotanker. We're going to spend a little time on this because this is really amazing. I remember as a kid, this kit came out in 1957, 
And I remember being in Hobby Rama uh, in Rockville Center, New York, staring at this box top and going, the airplane looks odd to me. Something is weird. It's like it melted in the sun or it's, I, I don't know. It's just, it's, it's really strange. Well, you know, 40, 50 years later, two, uh, two uh, times through art school, you kind of get the hang of what's going on. And here's what's going on. The airplane is rendered in four separate pieces. Here's what I mean. Let's start with the forward fuselage. The red line that you see there is the axis through the, uh, what they call the line of flight. So that's the direction the airplane is flying. Take a look at the angle. And now let's go to the wing section. See the difference? And here's what they call the barrel section, the constant uh, diameter of the fuselage. And the tail, yet four separate angles. So when you put them together, they look like this. And again, no disrespect to Dick Kishati, the artist. Uh, it was a brilliant, uh, brilliant talent. Uh, but it made you look at the cover. It created what they call visual tension. And uh, it really worked. So there's the airplane. You know, there's something missing, though. I've talked before about uh, the use of primary colors, red, yellow, and blue. You can see it there in the Ravel logo up in the upper right on the uh, title. Uh, and just like more cowbell, this cover needs more yellow. Ah, there it is, the finishing touch. Number six, it's a tie. We're down in Antarctica and during Operation Deep Freeze, and we're looking at a uh, Lockheed P2V7 taking off, and uh, uh, we're the guy up on that bulldozer wearing the parka. Uh, this built into a beautiful kit. This is an out-of-the-box buildup. It's got the skis and the uh, Deglo orange. And it's tied with the Sikorsky HO4S or H19, uh, Navy version of the H19 helicopter uh, in the same scenario. And I can guarantee you that those guys in the parkas were the model posing for Jack uh, in a parka. And they all did it at the same photo shoot. And they used those figures in two separate covers. The figures are drawn larger than life and or you could say the helicopter is probably two thirds or maybe three quarters actual size. Again, done on purpose. But it, uh, it, it makes it more dramatic. You can see the, uh, the guys, uh, you know, bending down under the rotor blast. And um, the H-19 is a large machine. I refueled one at Zons Airport, and it was like standing next to a building. Uh, but again, to get the helicopter into the cover and get the guys working uh, compositionally, this is the way it wound up. Number five, the SAS Caravel. This was a breakthrough cover. It had the purple and uh, pink and purple sky, uh, the beautiful uh, chrome lit by a spotlight next to the runway somehow. And um, this was one of a series of new look covers. Uh, in 1961, Ravel uh, got a new art director, a Society of Illustrators member named Howard Goldstein, took the reins from Dick Kishati and uh, it created a whole new look to the uh, to the kits. Uh, us model builders at that era were uh, growing into our teens. And so this offered something a little more modern and uh, was very effective. Uh, the reason the Swiss Air airplanes are in the back is you could uh, send 10 cents into Ravel and get Swiss Air decals for the uh, model, which came in SAS colors, I should mention. And this is uh, this little section of the cover is the what I'd like to call a Lenwoodism. It's two Swiss Air caravels, right? Take a good look. You see the tail behind the first airplane. Where's the rest of that airplane? Where's the wings and the landing gear? There is none. It's a tail floating in space, and it made you look at the cover. And of course, I had to send 10 cents to 4223 Glencoe Avenue, Venice, California, and I got my Swiss Air decals and built a French airplane with Swiss markings and a uh, English Corgi uh, armored personnel carrier on the tar paper roof of my apartment building in a uh, futile attempt at model photography in 1961 with a brownie star flash camera, but there it is. Favorite cover number four, the USS Ranger. I mentioned uh, in other videos, this is the first model I ever saved up a ton of money. It was $2.98 and uh, bought the model because I wanted the box cover. I wanted that box art. It was just so compelling. This is John Steele. And uh, again, the three primary Ravel artists, Jack Lenwood, Dick Kishati, and, and John Steele. And uh, Steele had a, a, a very different look. It was kind of a loose, splashy use of uh, a very painterly approach 
to rendering the uh, machinery, and yet it, it really worked uh, very well. Um, now, it's odd that we're landing in a right-hand pattern. We're standing on the wing of this FJ Fury, and uh, the, the guy in front of him is just attaching the three-wire on the deck, and it's going to get very exciting down there when this thing lands a few seconds later. But again, it was for effect, and it was done uh, quite uh, adeptly. Uh, it was inspired by an earlier Ravel aircraft carrier, the USS Franklin D. Roosevelt, where they had that same idea of standing on the, you know, looking over the shoulder of the pilot as he lands. Here we have two uh, F-9 uh, Panthers landing on the deck at the same time, kind of like Oshkosh at the air show where they put three airplanes on the runway at once. But um, again, it's just a, a visual, uh, you know, attraction to get your eye looking at that cover and to get you by the, by the kit. Favorite cover number three. The Regulus II. This is going to be fun. I want to spend a little moment on this because uh, this is Jack Lenwood's depiction of the missile. Uh, it was a uh, unmanned uh, cruise missile that took off, uh, used landing gear, and was recovered after test flights. The operational missiles were obviously meant for a one-way trip. Uh, but you notice there are wires on the landing gear. What's that all about? Well, if you look at the real airplane, there are wires connecting the gear. Those are uh, ground safety locks. The nose gear retracts forward and the main gear retracts aft. And these wires prevent that from happening accidentally on the ground. But Jack put them in the, in the kit, again, to attract your eye. I always wondered, how could they retract the gear if, the, if they're connected by wires? But here's what I want to mention. If you take away the background, a couple of things happen. The missile comes to a dead stop, number one. And number two, you can see that Jack used uh, his uh, photo reference uh, of the missile uh, on the ground, which is fine. But I'm going to ask you to take a good look at the blue on the top. Just, just put your eyes on the blue of the missile. I'm going to add the Ravel logo. Do you see how that color comes alive? And then let's put the background back in. And this is just a blockbuster cover. And it was a beautiful kit as well. Favorite number two. The Eastern Connie. Here's this beautiful airliner, this elegant looking Lockheed Constellation uh, cruising along above the clouds. It, you can just hear those uh, right 3350s grinding away. And the Golden Falcon name was uh, a marketing uh, angle for Eastern in the mid 1950s to uh, uh, create all first class service. Uh, they had DC 7Bs from Douglas and they had constellations from Lockheed. And this was a really uh, uh, a step in the direction of uh, luxurious air travel. Uh, it says only the Golden Falcon offers all these comforts and conveniences. Are you ready? Air conditioning on the ground. Wow. But here we have the seasoned captain uh, pointing out the airplane's position. Looks like over the Gulf of Mexico to the uh, uh, four passengers up there in the first class lounge. And um, Golden Falcon service was, was pretty special. And so was the model. A beautiful use of the uh, cool and warm, light and dark, bright and dull. And uh, I wanted to mention how the background looks so different from the, from the airplane. And they do that by painting the background first. They mask out the shape of the airplane with uh, what they call frisket paper. And the background is uh, painted in what is called wet into wet. So the illustration board is literally wet with a sponge and the paint just bleeds into that water the way you see there. And then when the paint is dry, the airplane is rendered in the traditional uh, uh, methods of uh, commercial illustration. This is uh, water-based gouache on illustration board, very fast drying, good for tight deadlines. What's interesting is that the cover, it has the correct Golden Falcon in the Eastern, what they used to call the meatball on the forward fuselage. You can see the real airplane there at lower right. And yet the model in order to save cost is uh, just red, white, and blue on the decal sheet. And so it has the red duck hawk in the uh, forward meatball as well as the tail. Before we get into my top, number one uh, top uh, pick for best cover, uh, I want to uh, talk about a couple of honorable mentions. And one of them is the Grumman F-11 Tiger, a beautiful use of a light shape against a dark background. Very compelling cover to me. And we uh, built a model. It was beautiful. But this was one of four kits that was introduced in 1958, uh, along with the USS Forrestal. And uh, so you have the A-4 Skyhawk, the Tiger, uh, the Douglas A-3D Sky Warrior, and the Vought F-8U Crusader. And uh, if you ever built these kits, the color of the plastic, the dull gray, you'd paint the bottoms white. And it just, they looked just like the real Navy airplanes. They were just beautiful. Uh, next is uh, the Lockheed WV-2 Warning Stars, they were called. Early warning uh, radar picket airplane. 
uh, it was a derivation of the Eastern uh, Super G with the radar uh, dishes on top and bottom and uh, a beautiful model uh, built into a really nice uh, kit, minimal painting, just the uh, de-icer boots and a few details, the props. And there you had uh, WV2. And last, but certainly not least, the American Electra, an iconic kit uh, because it was uh, converted into the P3 Orion. So it was a, a limited, edition, limited edition kit when it was created. But here we have the, uh, uh, the airplane uh, screaming along on the runway at Burbank with the Hollywood Hills in the background in the rain. And uh, a typical example of how Ravel would jump the gun trying to be the first on the market. And again, I don't say this uh, derogatorily, but that was just, they would always try to be first and they would have early iterations of an airplane. So in this case, uh, they'd have the nose with the big black radome. And then when the airplane uh, came out a year later, uh, it was painted like you see here. But it made the kit that much more collectible and that much more interesting uh, to look at. So Mike's number one favorite Revell box art is. Big budget on the sound effects there. Jack Lenwood's Fairy Rotodyne. What can I say? Um, I'm going to use a word that isn't used too much in art, but this is a bombastic cover. Why? There is so much going on. This was an example of what Lenwood called his European wet look. He achieved this. He was inspired to this uh, from uh, traveling uh, through Europe and uh, just always uh, very aware of the atmospherics. And so to paint this, a rainy, uh, rainy night in uh, London, um, he would use what was called number one gray, the lightest gray you could have in designer's gouache without going to pure white. And it gave a, there was a feel about this especially with the reflections on the ground, it was just cold and wet. When you look uh, down below, um, what kind of airliner is that? Well, that's a DC-88007 that's missing its right horizontal stabilizer. So you can see the tail cone, little Lenwoodism there. And the nose wheel is cocked, uh, it's, 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 it's twisted at an odd angle. And again, that's to attract your eye. Uh, but it's uh, out of perspective compared to the main gear. When you look in the upper right of the cover, holy cow, look at all the stuff going on. It's neat that the uh, main rotor blades uh, kind of disappear uh, so as not to cover the airplanes or the buildings. But man, there's lights in those hangars and lights on the roofs and just stuff happening. Control tower, radar tower. Uh, boy, I just, you know, and oh, and there's an airplane in front of it as well. And yet it all comes together and works just perfectly. Look at the use of the uh, taxiway or runway lights, uh, even though taxiway lights are blue. We're living in Lenwood's world, God bless him. And uh, it's just one of the coolest and again, most bombastic looking illustrations that I could ever remember as a kid. The actual machine was really interesting. It first flew in 1957. Uh, it was a successful uh, aircraft in its own right. Uh, just commercially, it just never connected, but it was a, uh, you know, city to city type of a, a high speed helicopter carried 48 passengers, uh, had 185 mile an hour cruising speed, which was considerably faster than the uh, basic rotary wing aircraft at that time, and had a 400 mile range. So it was perfect for staged lanes in Europe or in the uh, Northeast US, uh, but it never, uh, never became operational. But it was a good looking machine when it was flying. And again, if you ever, if it did fly in service, uh, taking off on a rainy night in uh, London, I'm sure it would have looked just like this. So there you have it. A look at my top 10 favorite Ravel covers. I want to say thanks to uh, my model buddies, uh, of course, Max from Max's Models and all my LA friends. And a special thanks to my dear friend, Glenn Weaver, who inspired the top 10 best, worst, or whatever uh, lists that we would always uh, enjoy when, uh, whenever we got together and had lunch. So I appreciate that. Thank you for celebrating aviation with Mike Machat. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And until next time, take care. <laughs>